entire world's uses in a year. As the world races to avert catastrophic climate change, the sun offers by far the most abundant source of clean energy. And by harnessing it, countries can also power economic growth, expand electricity access, and reduce energy imports. Over the last decade, solar has gone from expensive novelty to the cheapest, fastest growing power source on Earth. But here's the thing, we could squander its potential if we don't plan for the future. Today, solar supply is just 2% of the world's electricity. And even though it might look like solar power could keep on growing exponentially, its rise could very well hit a ceiling, flattening out in coming decades far before it unseats dominant fossil fuels. In Europe, we're already seeing the slowdown. And if that happens on a global scale, the solar revolution could sputter out. Preventing that is the point of my new book, Taming the Sun. I argue that three types of innovation are needed to unlock solar's full potential. The first innovation is financial. Right now, solar needs to attract trillions of dollars to fuel its rise. But so far, the world's most deep-pocketed investors have largely sat on the sidelines. So the solar industry needs to take a page out of the playbook from the fossil fuel, automobile, and mortgage industries and bundle together solar projects so big institutional investors feel comfortable buying and trading them. I'm pretty confident the industry will figure that one out. But just as soon as solar gets over that funding speed bump, it could run into a much more serious <coughs> obstacle known as value deflation. See, all this investment will help the industry produce and deploy more solar panels, driving down the cost of building a new solar project. That's the good news. But the bad news is that the value of the electricity produced by solar will plunge even faster. As more solar panels come online, they'll flood the grid with power in the middle of the day, but shut off when the sun sets. Even though customers will need power during dinner time, the next solar panel will just feed them more lunchtime power. That's not very valuable. Soon, the value will fall below the cost, so it won't make economic sense to install any more solar panels. That will halt the momentum of solar's rise. Overcoming this barrier starts with technological innovation. Breakthroughs in solar technology could cause the cost of solar to plunge, enabling more solar to be deployed economically. Next generation technologies, such as perovskites, already exist in laboratories. They could transform today's heavy, rigid, and frankly ugly solar panels into lightweight, flexible, and colorful coatings that tomorrow could cover cityscapes around the world. Additionally, developing advanced solar thermal plants could convert the sun's energy into heat and use that heat to generate power 24 seven, rather than just at lunchtime. And one day, artificial leaf technology could even harness sunlight to make portable fuels, finally making oil obsolete. Still, even with these two types of innovation, solar will need a third to limit the decline of its value as more of it's deployed. And that would be systemic innovation which includes things like continent-spanning power grids that link sun-drenched deserts to power-hungry cities, <coughs> energy markets that pay for energy storage and flexible generators to smooth out the volatile swings of solar power, and smart software that can turn electric vehicles into mobile batteries to resupply the grid once the sun goes down. These innovative energy systems would preserve solar's value by making sure that solar power can be used no matter when it's produced or how it fluctuates. Promoting all three kinds of innovation will require urgent investments by governments all around the world. And that needs to start right now. If we wait until solar runs out of steam, it'll be too late to get it back on track. But if we get this right, the 21st century will finally be the one in which humankind secures cheap, clean, and virtually limitless energy, all by taming the sun. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks, everybody. Uh, that was the talk. Well, you can all go back to class. I'm joined now by Varun Sivaram from the Council on...
carry on talking about success, <laughs> I had a great joke too. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, so, so that joke felt flat. Um, look, I, I am so happy to be here. Th this is kind of like coming home. Um, I, I see all kinds of friendly faces in the audience. Um, my whole family and a half are here. I think I see my uncle there, my mom here, my dad there. I don't know why you guys distributed yourselves. This is like, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I will talk about DG later on. Um, I want to say thank you to John for having me. John, um, you know, I, I'm a fan of your work. Your work is in my syllabus. Um, uh, I want to say uh, thank you also to, uh, I, I see Sally, Sally here. I see Chris. I see uh, Arun. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to, to serve on the, the Precourt and Woods uh, councils. Thank you for having me. Um, Arun, just about a year ago, uh, you were hosting a study group session for the book here. And I got on my plane back to DC with this thick sheaf of papers from Arun with annotations on like every page. And I went, oh man, I got to rewrite this whole thing. So thank you. I, I made it through and, uh, I, and I think the book is better for it. Um, my mental health though, I don't know. <laughs> I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk to everybody uh, about some of the data and graphs behind the insights that you just saw on the video. Um, because I hear Stanford brings a pretty wonky crowd. So let me walk you through what this book is about, how it's structured, and what the data and modeling is that underpins some of my conclusions. Um, and then I'd love to chat some more with you, and I hear that we'll be able to do some questions afterwards. And, and I'm also signing books after, so feel free to stop by uh, and chat um, and, and check out the book if you're interested. So the book, Taming the Sun, is divided into four sections. The first section, called Playing the Long Game, kind of sets the stage. It sets up this paradox. Solar has come a very great distance just in the last decade, and yet, I argue, it has even further to go. The next three sections of the book will walk you through those three kinds of innovation that I mentioned. Financial innovation, technological innovation, and systemic innovation. You know, I start by talking about the abundant potential of solar energy. These two cubes give you a sense of that potential. More energy hits the Earth from the sun every hour than the world uses in an entire year. The, the problem, though, as you all well know, is that despite this abundant potential, solar is particularly inconvenient. Um, in contrast to energy-dense fossil fuels, solar is diffuse, uh, it is intermittent and volatile, and for 3,000 years, humanity has attempted to harness the sun's energy with quite minimal success. But now, we appear to be at a tipping point. And countries around the world are now seeing solar as a viable way to increase the proportion of clean, secure, and affordable energy in their mix. I use the example of India because India is like really going all in for solar. You know, my first blog post as a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in 2015 was why India's solar target is sheer idiocy. And <laughs> as it turns out, India's solar target turned out to be a stroke of genius. Um, in 2014, Prime Minister Modi entered office and said, India's not going to target the 20 gigawatts of solar that we had originally targeted under the, pri uh, the, the previous administration. We're going to multiply that by five. We're going to aim for 100 gigawatts. All of us said, there's no way uh, you're going you're gonna to meet this target. By the way, I just found my uh, undergraduate advisor in the audience, Bruce Clemens. Professor, thanks for coming. <laughs> Um, now, Professor Clemens, as you guys may know, is well known for uh, his wordplay. And so I'm going to try and sneak in uh, a few puns that hopefully you won't be the only one that gets. Um, so, so India decides it's going to dramatically ramp up its solar power. And you can see that ramp. Right now, you know, in 2018, um, we are less than 20% uh, of the way toward uh, India's target. India actually has not kept pace uh, toward that, that steep ramp up. But here's the thing. Even if India does achieve this 100 gigawatt target, which everyone thought was crazy, well, it's still only going to be powering about 10% of its electricity mix with solar energy. For solar to achieve all of the things that India wants, and Modi has called it the ultimate energy solution, 
to increase energy access, energy security, energy affordability, well, it's going to have to grow even more than that. And unfortunately, India's power grids probably aren't equipped to handle this influx of extremely intermittent energy. So this is just one example of a case where the hopes and expectations might clash with the realities and why I fear that if solar stalls in the coming decades, we could see a lot of expectations get dashed. You know, today's euphoria over solar is reminiscent of the euphoria in the 1970s over nuclear. Even before that, you heard folks say, nuclear will soon be too cheap to meter. It was the great hope for clean, cheap, and abundant uh, energy for all. And yet, nuclear energy hit this peak sometime uh, in the 1990s. I think 1996, it peaked, never achieving 20% of global electricity supply, and has declined ever since. You may say nuclear is very different from solar. So even though today solar accounts for 2% of global electricity, right where nuclear was in the 1970s, we should not be comparing the two. But I have the sneaking suspicion that there is actually an underlying similarity between nuclear and solar. That underlying similarity between the stories is a phenomenon called technology lock-in. That phenomenon is something where an, uh, a first generation clean energy technology. In nuclear, it was light water reactors and solar, it's silicon solar panels. That first generation technology can actually prevent the emergence of a next generation technology, locking it out through its dominance. It happened in nuclear. Because we don't have advanced nuclear designs commercially deployed uh, at, at great scale, because light water reactors account for 90 or greater than 90 percent of all nuclear deployment, it's possibly the case that uh, nuclear may never recover. In the case of solar, I desperately want to avoid this phenomenon of technology lock-in. Now, in the last uh, several decades, solar has made, has made dramatic strides, and I don't want to discount the progress we've made. So let me tell you a little bit about how far we've come. This is that popular NREL graph that probably half the room has seen. I'm showing you the lines for various different solar materials and how the efficiency of a single solar cell has improved over time. The dominant technology, silicon, is that blue line. And you see it's done well and even increased a little bit in the most recent years. But by and large, in recent decades, silicon has stayed put. You know, it's getting close to its theoretical efficiency ceiling. That red line, though, I'm going to single out uh, Thomas over there. He's the, the blonde Dutchman. Um, Thomas is one of the leading researchers uh, on perovskite, uh, a next generation uh, solar technology that's increased faster uh, than any other uh, emerging solar technology, actually mature or emerging technology. And let me tell you, I get to pick on Thomas because we went to grad school together and he picked on me throughout grad school. <laughs> now, in addition to technology progress, we've seen a remarkable manufacturing story. China has driven the cost of solar down through manufacturing scale. You know, today China accounts for over 70% of solar production. And increasingly, China is the largest market for solar deployment in the world. China now accounts for around 50% of all solar deployment. So thanks to Chinese government policy, we've seen this boom both in solar production and then solar deployment. It hasn't always had salutary effects. And we can talk in the question and answer session about you know, whether US companies or German companies went bankrupt as a result of Chinese government largesse toward its companies. But the fact remains that China and silicon have won the day, and that has been a good thing for the near-term deployment of cheap and abundant solar power. You can see the trend in costs around the world. Folks are signing long-term, 20-year contracts for solar power at prices that, are, that were once unheard of. If you told me a decade ago that we'd see two cents per kilowatt hour signed around the world, Latin America, the Middle East, I would tell you you are crazy, and yet that's what's happened. These costs are very real, even if they are for delivery of projects in a couple years. Uh, it, it doesn't change the fact that solar is now the cheapest source of electricity in many parts of the world. And that's a good thing. As a result, folks project this hockey stick-like trajectory for solar's growth. You're seeing, for example, projections in India, China, and the Middle East accounting for half of this growth. By 2040, Bloomberg projects solar could hit 15% of global electricity, and I target 33% by mid-century. But here's the problem. This hockey stick-like trajectory isn't going to happen 
on current course and speed. At least that's my prediction. That's my warning. And in the book, I argue that unless we proactively invest in those three kinds of innovation, financial, technological, and systemic, this trajectory could turn into an S-curve. And that S-curve could be catastrophic. If we get to that S-curve, it will already be too late. We will have let solar stall, let a clean energy transition stall, and not really done anything to prepare the groundwork to avoid it. I told you a little bit about value deflation. Now let me give you some numbers. These are three simulations of three different electricity grids around the world that a colleague at GTM and I compiled for Nature Energy. You can see that across Texas, Germany, and California, at 15% of the electricity coming from solar in a grid, the value of that electricity plummets by 50%. At 30% of electricity in a particular mar market, the value plummets by 70%. And I told you that we want solar to get to 33% globally. If we're going to get to that proportion, well, solar is going to have to get a lot cheaper a lot faster because its value is going to erode very quickly as it produces more and more lunchtime power, even as dinnertime power is what's in demand. <clears throat> now, a lot of folks, as I've given talks like this around the country, a lot of folks have said, look, why are you so hell-bent on solar being the primary driver of decarbonization? Until last week, I had to tell them, you know, it's the, the, this and that reason, and like I've done this modeling, and whatever. Now I have somebody else to talk about. Just last week, Shell released their sky scenario. Shell, this is an oil company, guys. Shell said, hey, here's a scenario that realistically can achieve a below two degrees climate trajectory. And in that trajectory, Shell predicts that solar will have to achieve 36% of the electricity mix by 2050 and 62% of final energy demand by 2100. That's not just electricity. That is global, total uh, final energy consumption for humanity. If I and an oil company can agree on something, and it happens to be the primacy of solar toward meeting our climate goals, maybe we're on to something. Now, this graph should more visually demonstrate to you why value deflation happens. This is our state, California. I get to say it's our state, right? Even though I live uh, over in that awful place, Washington. Um, in our state, this is uh, last March, you saw solar produce 50% of the electricity right around noontime. And as a result, power prices actually went negative. They were paying you to shut off your power plants. And then power prices spike in the evening when the sun sets and wipes out solar output. This is a very visual representation of why it is the case that solar's value declines as more of it's deployed. In California, we've got over 10% of our supply coming from solar. What happens when we need to get to 30, 33%? This picture, or the familiar duck curve that many of you have seen, will only be exacerbated. All right, that's setting the stage. Now let's talk about the hopeful stuff. You know, I, I, I talked with um, uh, Gwen and Sonny from Aurora Solar before this, and, and we talked a lot about all the problems solar faces. And at the very end, Gwen goes, come on, man. Like, can you just give us some hope? <laughs> so I'd love to give you some hope. Um, <clears throat> let me talk about the three kinds of innovation and, and drill into them just a little bit more than what you saw in the video. The first kind of innovation is financial innovation. You know, as I mentioned, solar could run into this capital crunch, a shortfall of investment capital. Bloomberg projects in that top graph that between now and 2040, we could see a shortfall of two and a half trillion dollars between what we need to keep that hockey stick trajectory going and what current investors are probably willing to provide. Now, those current investors aren't the most deep-pocketed investors in the world. Those are the institutional investors, and they've largely sat on the sidelines. So the bottom graph breaks out how we could meet that shortfall if those institutional investors got in the game. Um, it's, like a, it's like an EA Sports promo, get in the game. No one? <laughs> the guys who played like FIFA 2004 are laughing. So, uh, in that bottom graph, there are several ways that in addition to the current sources of investment, you could see institutional investors provide both debt and equity financing. Here's one. You could provide equity financing if institutional investors had vehicles that they could buy and, buy and trade on public equity markets, on stock markets. Now, yield codes were the first incarnation of such a vehicle. The logic here is pretty good. You pool together a lot of solar projects 
you put them into a vehicle, it's a diversified portfolio, and you enable people to buy and trade them so they no longer have liquidity risk. They also don't have due diligence constraints because they're trading a diversified portfolio. This is great. The problem, though, was in the design of the initial Yield Co. vehicles. They were designed in such a way that there were some conflicts of interest between the parent developers and the child Yield Co.'s, uh, conflicts of interest over governance, for example. And there were also uh, structured in such a way that these yield co's had to greedily continue to grow in order to keep their stock prices rising and pay out the dividends that they had promised investors. These were all mistakes in what should have been the design of a very boring instrument. What institutional investors need is a boring instrument to package together boring solar projects. That's their strength. Boring solar projects pay out revenue year after year for 20 years they're very low risk because there's very little you have to do to maintain the projects, and they're uncorrelated with market volatility. That's what we should be aiming for, and I believe, and I write in my book, that there could be a second generation of yield codes, the Europeans are already on this, that are much more conservative and frankly boring. Here's another cool way that we can source capital, especially for distributed solar assets. Remember the uh, financial crisis when we packaged and sliced and diced mortgage securities? Let's do the same thing for solar. Um, no laughs there. Uh, no, don't do the same thing for solar, but, but do something similar. Do it responsibly. Um, Asset-backed securities are actually uh, a you know, popular uh, investment destination, and they are used responsibly in a large number of asset classes. I think that they could be used in solar. And already in 2017, we saw over a billion dollars of solar securitization. Now, some of the most exciting stuff, you know, I just flew through those uh, investment slides because they're kind of boring. Some of the most exciting stuff, though, is in the developing world. You know, over a billion people still lack access to uh, electricity, reliable electricity. They're concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, as you can see from this graph. And new business model innovations are enabling folks to get a taste of electricity for the first time. This is the pay-as-you-go model. It's a business model innovation that was pioneered in East Africa, now is being uh, rolled out in South Asia, and is enabling folks to purchase a solar panel uh, and battery installation with basically no money down. Because the startups are able to source their capital, well actually right now they're sourcing their capital from venture capitalists, but down the road they'll be able to source their capital from financial markets to build those upfront systems. Consumers then will just pay using mobile money. Mobile money has taken off, for example, in East Africa, uh, organizations like M-Pesa. And using that mobile money, you can actually pay off your entire solar installation and own a valuable asset. Now you've got the solar system. It's got solar panels, it's got a battery, it's got some appliances. And that system can be used as collateral for you to take out a loan. So not only are you bringing ele electricity to consumers for the first time, you're actually economically empowering them to have credit. This is a big deal. Now, it's not just business model innovation. On top of this, you've got the falling cost of hardware. And I want to say that not only are solar panels and batteries falling in cost, but so are the energy efficient appliances that enable these systems to pencil economically. Look at the cost declines there, 26% in the cost of energy efficient DC appliances. What can governments do? I haven't even talked about governments, and I work at a public policy institution. Come on. Governments can absolutely help here. You know, in many cases, I urge governments to just kind of get out of the way and allow financial markets to do what they do best. But in cases like this in the developing world, it's actually important for a government like Nigeria's, if they want to meet their energy access goal, to coordinate efforts between the central government and organizations that are nimbly trying to bring off-grid electricity systems to villagers. Because if the government doesn't tell these off-grid system developers that they're coming in, and then the government extends the grid, they can put those developers out of business and chill the investment climate. So here's an example of how Nigeria has demarcated different areas of the country as optimal for a particular type of electrification. Some areas are optimal for extending the electricity grid. Some areas are optimal for developing microgrids or individual solar home systems. Ultimately, the grid should you know, extend and, and link up with those microgrids. But in the near term, if you're going to make a very aggressive energy access target, it's a good idea to coordinate. All right, the part you've all been waiting for, cool technologies, because that's what we do here, right? We, we reinvent solar. Um, you know, I, 
I was, uh, I was very lucky uh, to work uh, in Oxford along with Thomas in the lab of a, of a real visionary, Dr. Henry Snaith. Many of you may know him. Um, and you know, I will be perfectly honest, um, I did not recognize the transformative potential of the perovskite early on. So Thomas makes fun of me because I was at the time making nanowire solar cells. And I said, you know what, nanowires are a great idea because they will streamline charge transport. We'll just, they'll turn into electron highways and we will collect charges really efficiently. And the perovskite was discovered by a, a fellow grad student. And I said, perfect. I'm going to put the perovskite on top of my nanowires. Completely missing the fact that one of the cool things about the perovskite is it's very good at charge transport. I no longer need the nanowires. And so, you know, I made one of these devices with nanowires and the perovskite on top, and I said to my professor, look, this device performs at 3% uh, power conversion efficiency. That's three times better than I was doing yesterday. And my professor says, I know, if you took the nanowires away, it would be 10%. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, anyway, I, I, I said that preemptively, because I knew you would raise your hand and ask that question in the questions here. So, this is, this is a cell that, uh, that, that one of uh, Thomas's and my colleague, Sam Strengths, uh, made over at MIT. It demonstrates that perovskites could actually be flexible. You know, this material gives you a lot of versatility. You can make it flexible, you can make it semi-transparent, you can make it colorful, and on top of that, you can make it super efficient. Um, still, it is the case that these perovskite solar cells, if they go up against the silicon behemoth incumbent, are probably going to lose because there are a lot of examples. There is this you know, graveyard littered with companies that tried to go up against silicon, tried to go up against Chinese behemoths. So that's why Oxford Photovoltaics, which is the company that uh, Henry Snaith has spun off, is targeting tandem devices. They're trying to take perovskites, which are a great technology in their own right, and putting them right on top of silicon so that if you have a silicon panel with a perovskite coating, you have a performance boost. Perovskite, as you can see in the bottom left-hand side of that slide, is helping to harness a different part of the solar spectrum, the high-frequency part of the spectrum, than silicon is. That tandem piggyback approach might be a way to gain some commercial scale of manufacturing perovskites. And then down the road, you might then be able to make perovskite-only devices, even perovskite on perovskite tandems. Here's a rough sketch of how good such devices could get. Um, on the left-hand side, you see two other emerging technologies, quantum dots and organic cells. <coughs> Perovskites, as you can see, have managed to achieve a 22.7% cell efficiency. Um, you know, folks are improving their stability, they're improving uh, their performance characteristics, they're making them bigger. Silicon, of course, is still better than perovskite, but perhaps not for long. And the silicon-perovskite tandem might very soon surpass silicon alone. Down the road, though, I'm excited for the prospect of perovskite-only tandem devices. Thomas is working on some of them. I, I think you actually own the world record for them, right? He, he nods modestly. Yep. Um, down the road, we could actually see perovskite-only devices achieving a 35% efficiency. So let me recap. Perovskites could be dirt cheap because you could literally print them. They could be highly efficient. They could be flexible, semi-transparent and lightweight, they could revolutionize the way that solar is deployed around the world. Now, I don't only want to talk about photovoltaics, I also want to talk about concentrated solar power. See, concentrated solar power, for those of you not in the field, this is mirrors concentrating the sun's rays to generate heat. Concentrated solar power comes with built-in storage. Now that you have a hot fluid, you can store it. You can store it in the form of molten salts. You can generate electricity in the middle of the night. And that's going to be increasingly valuable, especially as solar value deflation starts to take root. So even though CSP, concentrated solar power, uh, has seen a market lull in recent years as photovoltaics has raced ahead, I foresee that as photovoltaics penetration increases, we're going to see more demand for CSP. And you can see even more demand if technological innovation for CSP actually increases the cost down to that 2020 target or even lower. And the way to do that is to increase the temperature uh, to which the mirrors heat up uh, that solar energy. 
because then you can store the energy more efficiently and you can also generate power more efficiently by using different thermodynamic cycles. For example, the Brayton cycle with supercritical carbon dioxide instead of steam. Finally, I'm really excited about artificial leaf technology. Now this stuff is kind of way out there, all right? Uh, th this will be deployed probably not in the next decade, but beyond that. But it is an exciting prospect to think that instead of oil refineries, we could have solar refineries in the future. We could have this case where artificial leaf technology harnesses sunlight to split water, generating hydrogen fuel, which could be used as a transport fuel. That's what you see in the right-hand side, the top right-hand side of that diagram. Or it could be combined with carbon dioxide, for example, a waste product from a smokestack, and used for a range of industries, fertilizer, plastics, pharmaceuticals, etc. So solar is not just an electricity source. It is a source for powering our entire economy. That's really important, and that's what underpinned Shell's prediction that if we're going to meet the two degrees decarbonization scenario, we're going to need solar to do double duty. It's going to have to produce electricity. It's also going to have to produce fuels. All right, let's put it all together. This is the final part of the book. Um, by the way, I, I, I will note that uh, this is only a small subset of the fun charts and graphs in the book, so I'm not giving it all away. <laughs> So the final chapter, uh, the, the, the final part is about systemic innovation. You know, I argue that there are, there's a whole battery of approaches to integrating solar power, and a battery is only one of them. And Dr. Creason got it. Dr. Creason, I want to thank you and, and Mrs. Creason for joining tonight. Um, you guys have been so formative uh, throughout my career. Thank you. Um, and also, thank you for laughing at that. <laughs> no one else laughed at that joke. Come on, guys. Um, this is one way that, this is one way that we can uh, integrate solar energy into uh, our power systems by expanding the size of our grid and also by making our grids much smarter at the micro scale. Now, neither of these is the intuitive solution of just pairing batteries with solar. But again, I argue that there's a whole panoply of ways to make our power systems more flexible. Larger grids are great because you can aggregate supply and demand over a larger area, which enables you to smooth out volatility. Smarter grids are great because you can marshal lots of different demand side resources. Now to get the, boast, the best of both worlds, um, I created uh, this ugly busy graphic, which attempts to say that a hybrid grid, which has long distance, high voltage DC transmission at the macro scale, but also networked microgrids at the micro scale that are super smart, well that might be the way to get the best of all worlds, to integrate the largest amount of renewable electricity possible. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about batteries, because the point I always get is, look, man, batteries are falling in cost. Why can't we just rely on them to store solar energy and counteract value deflation? Well, batteries are indeed falling in cost. But there are a whole lot of energy storage that are not just batteries. This graph shows you some of them. And if we only relied on batteries, here's what would happen. Colleagues at MIT and I have simulated the Texas power grid and we determined that if you only used batteries, and we assumed really cheap batteries, $150 per kilowatt hour fully installed, and really cheap solar, 25 cents per watt, four times cheaper than today's solar. Well, if you had all this, solar still wouldn't be a majority of your electricity in the lowest cost grid configuration. That's because batteries still aren't very good at storing electricity for longer than a few hours. And solar is intermittent over the course of days, weeks, months, seasons. There are a whole lot of storage requirements. And there are a whole lot of technologies to achieve that storage. Batteries are just one of them. Lithium ion batteries in particular are just one of them. I'll end because I've got 32 seconds. I will end with the last policy recommendation. Look, I think that governments really need to focus on technological and systemic innovation. And I think that energy innovation spending is a crucial driver of enabling the United States to be a leader in some of these new technologies. That's why I was thrilled last week when President Trump miraculously signed the omnibus spending bill that will increase funding for solar energy research and development by 16% and increase overall funding for energy innovation and continue to fund the organization ARPA-E that Arun founded. It is a phenomenal organization. We need to keep doing that because if we don't, as you can see from this figure, China is going to eclipse us, no pun intended, um, 
Even Bruce isn't laughing. I mean, uh, he's, he's disowned me as he his is, advisee. He's, he's um, <clears throat> going to eclipse the United States in terms of its leading role in energy innovation. So, Arun, sorry to embarrass you, but you embarrassed me. Um, thank you so much for saying these really nice words. Uh, I hope you guys uh, take a chance to check out the book. And thanks so much for listening. It's really great to be back. Thanks, Arun, and thanks for leaving time for questions. You know, I didn't use the uh, PV uh, magazine title for you, The Hamilton of Solar Energy, because I, I didn't actually know what the heck that meant. Now I think I know what it means. Uh, any, any questions? We usually like to start with students first. Student questions? There's a student with a question. Sir. Do you anticipate perovskites being able to be stable enough for long-term use? I mean, you really should answer that question, but I'm going to try. Um, perovskites uh, have been demonstrated in laboratory settings uh, to be stable for over 1,000 hours of testing. They've also actually been demonstrated in real-world settings uh, to be stable you know, on that timescale of months. Um, I actually don't think that there will be a stability problem if perovskites are encapsulated in the same way as silicon solar cells are encapsulated in a way that really prevents moisture ingress, uh, moisture you know, attacks perovskites uh, particularly badly. Um, I do think that you know, it, it'll be important down the road if you want to make perovskite only products uh, to figure out how to really protect the material if you're encapsulating it inside polymers. You really need to protect it from, for example, uh, moisture without the benefit of the heavy encapsulation materials that are used in silicon solar panels. Thomas, did I miss anything? Um, the thousand hour tests are accelerated tests. So typically if you pass those, then that indicates you can have a 10 to 20 year uh, lifetime. Exactly, so, so, so thousand hours is, is a stress test. So it, it, it indicates that you'll survive for even longer than 1,000 hours. You've been light soaked, for example. Oftentimes, you may be under uh, high humidity, high temperature, et cetera. Thanks for the question. Great. Over there. Thank you, Varun. Hey. Good to see you. Uh, I would love to know what the <laughs> But I'm acting surprised. <laughs> I'd love to know what the implications are of perovskite technology on the installation component of the cell, both in commercial, or residential, or, or grid scale. I think that's a great question. Um, and, and, and to back up a step, you know, a lot of people have asked me, why on earth are you supporting innovation in solar materials? Look, the solar panel itself accounts for a minority of the cost of the solar installation, right? So if solar panels are a dwindling cost component, uh, it, it, it may not be a good idea to continue innovating in that part of the system. You should innovate in the rest of the system, known as the balance of systems. But it is the case that the more efficient your uh, solar cell or solar panel, uh, the lower the rest of your costs are. Because the more efficient your solar panel is, the less your solar panel costs, but also the less land you need, the less labor you need, the less equipment you need to mount those fewer panels, etc. cetera. Um, so, so I think that more efficient silicon perovskite tandems immediately give you a benefit not just on the module cost, but on the installation cost. Beyond that, I actually think that uh, perovskite only or other you know, flexible, lightweight uh, materials allow you to have dramatically different system econ uh, economics. For example, you could have building integrated PV that honestly just has a completely different cost structure than today's silicon solar panels. Um, you could be Rather than installing ground-mounted solar panels, you could be carpeting deserts with coatings. You might even replace them every couple of years because they're so cheap. You might even throw away a whole lot of the power and turn them into rampable power plants during the day. There are all kinds of opportunities that open up um, when you have dirt-cheap uh, materials, which is why I, t I tend to reject the notion that we should compare today's system costs with what tomorrow's technologies can offer us. Thanks for the question. Come on, let's go right there. Um, I'll go back and move on. Go ahead, yes. yes. Hi, Varun. I'm curious about some of the underlying causes of technology lock-in, why it happens with some technology it's not with others, and what do you think is necessary to prevent it from happening with solar panel production? So I think technology lock-in, first of all, is not a solar-specific uh, phenomenon. It's not even a nuclear-specific phenomenon or energy-specific. It happens across fields. A common uh, cited example of technology lock-in is the QWERTY keyboard. 
You know, they say that they invented the QWERTY layout so that typists didn't type too fast and jam the typewriters. But now we're stuck with it uh, because everybody uses it. Um, so technology lock-in has many different causes. One cause in the QWERTY keyboard case is network effects. The more that a particular technology is used, uh, the more valuable it becomes, making it difficult for another technology. Raise your hands if you guys use Dvorak keyboards. Not a single one. See, there you go. Locked out. Um, <laughs> network effects are, are, are one driver. Another driver is economic scale. If a technology is able to achieve economies of scale, that is massive production scale that enables your variable costs to swamp your fixed costs, or learning, you've achieved scale and so you've gotten really good at optimizing your production process, well, that's another way you can have lock-in. A final way you can have lock-in is through what's called regulatory lock-in. If your public policy regulations are tailored, for example, to light water nuclear reactors, it's really hard for that next nuclear reactor, say a small modular reactor, to break in. Because that small modular reactor may well require very different uh, emergency planning zone sizes, for example, uh, very different uh, safeguards, and yet it has to conform to the same regulations that were tailored for light water reactors. So these are all different causes of lock-in. Uh, but lock-in is a, a well-known phenomenon, and I worry that it's taking root in, in solar. Did I answer your question? I guess. Yeah. Straight back up the hill there. Yeah. Thanks. So thanks very much for your talk. Uh, I just wondered, in your book, do you address at all uh, structure or governance of an ideal public-private partnership for the US or Europe to contest with China? Yes. Um, the China case uh, is, is a very interesting um, public policy case. Look, it is definitely the case that China uh, underbid, or, or rather, that, that Chinese manufacturers produced panels and sold them below cost on global markets. By the way, I can tell you that because Dr. Reichelstein, uh, sitting there, just gave me a look. But, but it's your research, I think, that shows that uh, the price of solar panels was below an economically sustainable uh, level, um, especially in the period uh, during which Chinese manufacturers increased their hold on global markets. Was that an accurate statement? define economically sustainable cost and whether pricing below that is uh, an offense, so to speak. Oh, I haven't called it an offense. But I am saying that that's what happened. Now, now whether it's, a, it's an offense, uh, you and I can definitely debate. But this is a case where, as a result of Chinese manufacturers uh, producing a lot of solar panels, and you know, th they had the help of uh, extensive uh, loans from China Development Bank, for example, as a result of this, a lot of US firms went out of business. Now, the policy response from the United States has been three sets of tariffs, two under President Obama, one under President Trump. Uh, and, and, and I don't actually believe that any of these sets of tariffs are going to solve the problem. I don't think that we're, we're going to have competitive manufacturing here in the United States as a result of any of these tariffs. Um, and, and frankly, we'll probably be poking ourselves in the eye because we will destroy jobs in the installation of solar. Uh, we might invite retaliation from China. You're already seeing some Chinese retaliation. Um, and uh, you know, I, I should think that one perverse effect has been discouraging innovation. There are companies like SunPower that depend on revenue from imported uh, panels, but also conduct R&D here in the United States that aren't going to be able to conduct that R&D because that's the first thing that goes to not affect their earn, uh, the quarterly earnings bottom line. So um, many reasons for why tariffs are not the right idea. Your question, though, was, what, so what do we do? Um, is there a way, for example, for there to be some international cooperation where, you know, in cases not just of solar, but clean energy products broadly, batteries, for example, can there be an early warning system or a body that monitors uh, firms to determine whether they're pricing below cost or a special safeguards agreement that is an addition to uh, or, or a side agreement to the World Trade Organization saying for these list of, this list of environmental goods, uh, perhaps uh, we'll have you know, a, a particular protocol for handling disputes uh, in an expeditious fashion. I don't actually know what the, what the right solution is, but I can certainly tell you that uh, the tariffs were definitely the wrong solution. Right, yeah. Let's go here and then back up the aisle. Yeah. Uh, do you think the massive ramp up in electric vehicle uh, technology is going to provide a, a way of uh, evening out this uh, electric demand curve to yeah. solar TV. Yeah, it, and is it going to be soon enough? And is that addressed in the, uh, uh, the forecast? It, it could really go either way. You know, th this is one of those cases where we don't know which 
uh, which way this is going to go. Electric vehicles are coming, everybody, and they're going to stress grids out. And without proactive planning, uh, electric vehicles uh, could sharply increase demand, for example, on congested distribution circuits, require costly infrastructure upgrades so that electric utilities can serve those customers. Um, and it's not clear at all that electric vehicles are going to make it easier rather than harder to integrate solar energy. Uh, they may just make demand more peaky at the wrong times of the day. Um, however, you, you, I think you're on to something really profound, which is there is this new source of demand coming on the grid, electric vehicles, and if we harness them right, they could turn into fleets of mobile batteries to be used in service of balancing supply and demand. In order for that to happen, I think you need two things. First, you need intelligent infrastructure. You need a system of charging net, uh, stations that is uh, digitally connected, both through communication networks and managed through intelligent protocols, uh, so that you can tell exactly where all the electric vehicles are charging um, and uh, when they are charging. Second, I think you need price signals. If utilities send price signals that are very granular at a geographic and temporal domain to these electric vehicles saying, now is a good time to charge, there is a glut of solar energy on the grid, and they're incentivized to do so. Otherwise, they're going to go ahead and charge when it's convenient for the, for the driver, which may very well not be convenient for the grid. Um, that, I think, could compound the problems we have with an increasing share of intermittent solar energy, not solve them. OK, last question. What are your predictions for um, decreasing the footprint of solar panels and for increasing efficiency for ch in chips and panels? Yeah, so, so, so if you want to decrease, I assume you're talking about the, the physical footprint, not the environmental footprint. Right. Yeah, so, so the best way to decrease the footprint is to increase the efficiency. And that's what some of these technologies like perovskites promise to do. Look, if you, if you are able to achieve um, a 30% a efficient solar panel or coating in the future, you'll correspondingly reduce the land area needed for solar uh, compared with you know, today's 20% or less than 20% uh, efficient commercial products. That could be very important. Yeah, I mean, in that particular case, you go from 20% to 30%. I think you d decrease your land area requirement by 50%. But, but what's, why that's important is that <coughs> even today, when solar is just 2% of the world's electricity mix and growing, we're already seeing land scarcity issues. For example, in India, the initial auctions were super easy uh, to achieve because developers went ahead and found parcels of land, they won their auctions, they provided contracts, and they built their uh, projects. But now, we're in a regime where developers are struggling to secure parcels of land. There are eminent domain issues. They need to consolidate land to build these large projects. And so not only do they have to you know, design and permit a particular installation, they've got to go search, scour for land. I think land will become an increasingly important constraint. And that's why efficiency will become even more important. Thanks for the question. Great. Thanks for, I guess I had one question. When do you turn 35? <laughs> Six years. <laughs> um, thanks again. Uh, before we wrap up here, I want to announce that Varun has graciously agreed to do a little meet and greet book signing uh, with cookies provided by Mary right outside the auditorium here. And with that, let's give Varun one last thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.